Welcome to Face to Face. This is a show about change and about what's next. It's a show that wants to ask questions, peel back the layers of our average everyday experience and go beyond scratching the surface. We interview amazing people with incredible ideas and stories who have done wild, weird and wonderful things. Remember that imagination shared create collaboration and collaboration creates community and community inspires social change. I'm David Peck and this is Face to Face. Well, welcome to Face to Face for another interview with, I think, uh, somebody who's going to prove to be a pretty interesting guest, uh, Kevin Flatt, who is Assistant Professor uh, of History at Redeemer University College in Ancaster. Mm-hmm. I know right now most of you are either shaking or nodding your head and probably have no idea where that is. But uh, Kevin, thanks for joining us today. It's good to be here with you, David. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to what we're going to be uh, chatting about. He, he's, uh, as I said, professor of history. His book, uh, fairly recently published, mm-hmm. After Evangelicalism, subtitled The 60s and the United Church of Canada, uh, was published this summer, so 2013. That's right. Uh, yeah. By McGill and Queen's University Press. His uh, research has been featured on uh, in many publications. And he started out in economics and, and moved into history. And I think I that did. might be my opening question for you, Kevin, yeah. before we get into, you know, Protestantism or evangelicalism or the United Church or any of those other things. I'd love for you to tell me a little bit about your history. Yeah. Kind of corny, I know, professor of history. Uh, but why did you leave economics? Well, uh, I did a master's degree essentially as a stalling tactic. <laughs> okay. I, I <clears throat> was coming to the end of my BA and uh, had no idea of what I was going to do for a living. Um, thought maybe teaching of some kind and figured if I did a master's degree, it would give me a year to think about it and uh, some additional education. And history was really my first love. I'd gone into economics partly because I thought uh, that it would be a field that would give me employability um, and partly because I was good at math and figured that I'd be able to use that in economics in a way that I wouldn't in history. So I did, I did the economics degree, but then when I decided on the stalling tactic strategy, I figured, well, I really love history, so let's give that a shot. And I ended up staying and uh, ultimately doing my PhD in history as well. What was it about the shift? You, you know, you, so you love numbers, you love mathematics. Mm-hmm. I mean, that to me is, a, you know, looking for a job. Those are pretty good reasons for doing a degree in a particular field. Yeah. Sounds like your passion went over, though. It, it did, yeah, it absolutely did. Um, I was also keeping one eye cocked to the high school teaching area, Uh and history is a subject that's taught more commonly than economics. So that was one thing I had in the back of my mind as well. But I've loved history ever since I was probably 10 years old, and uh, yeah, the passion definitely won out. So uh, was there anything that you took from economics that has made you a better historian? You're, you're, you're working in a department that I believe has just formed an international studies mm-hmm. sort of division. Is that a fair way to say That's it? That's right, yeah. Uh, another vertical. Yeah. <laughs> um, there's got to be connections there. Absolutely there are. I mean, the, the thing is when you work in any social science, but particularly economics, you learn to think in terms of systems. You learn to think in terms of uh, multiple consequences, multiple causes, unforeseen consequences. Um, And I think that way of thinking, even though I don't do economic history, that way of thinking I bring with me into the sorts of history that I do. And yeah, now that we have an international studies program at Redeemer, um, which includes an international development aspect, it includes courses and things like international political economy, I have a vocabulary with which I can engage those kinds of subjects. I've always loved, and I'm sure this has come up in uh, other podcasts that I've done, but um, fortune tellers were put on the world to make economists look good. You've heard yes. that before? Yeah. Is there truth in that? Well, the one I've heard is if you have two economists in a room, you'll have three opinions. Right. Right. Very good. So uh, how, how? So I don't want to focus on uh, uh, economics. However, I'm still interested yeah. uh, because I do see the thread and the connections as well. And you say you love mathematics. Mm-hmm. From your four years, uh, how connected are math and economics? Well, they're hugely connected, uh, and especially the way the discipline of economics is taught in most North American universities. It's, it's hmm. very much a quantitative, empirical mm. discipline, uh, even to the detriment of teaching about theory. 
Uh, so for example, um, in my degree, I did, I did four years of it, um, I only ever had one course in which we talked about economic theorists to any extent, or the history of the discipline, hmm. which is a real shame. Mm -hmm. um, and certainly I think there's a lot of, of benefits from the empirical and quantitative approaches, um, but I think it's overemphasized. Now that being said, I, I still use some of the statistical skills that I learned in some yeah, of my current it. research, which is a little bit more in the area of sociology of religion, uh, so regression analysis, those sorts of things. So some of the specific skills have stuck with me in a way I wasn't necessarily expecting when I switched to history. Um, I think I got the joke wrong. Economists were put on the world to make fortune tellers look good, I think right. is the joke. Right. Anyway, yeah. A, a nice, nice podcast interview there, Peck. Um, I guess the reason I asked you the question about math and e economics mm -hmm. being connected, I mean, it seems to me that there's probably way more theory that goes into this than, than, than economists sometimes are willing to admit. Oh, yeah. Or statisticians, you know. It's, it's not just about the hard numbers. It's not just about the logic of it. Mm -hmm. uh, this is about trends. This is about demographics. It's about uh, behavior. All kinds of things that you can't really quantify. That's right. In in the, I think well, I mean, there are things you can quantify, but not in the most important way. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? It does. Yeah. There's a lot of things that are very important that can't be measured. Yeah. And there's a lot of things that are measurable that aren't important. Right. And regardless, uh, you have to decide what you're going to measure, what things are you going to track, uh, what variables are you going to put into your regression model, um, and so there's all kinds of decisions that have to be made before you ever get to number crunching which rely on worldview, philosophical presuppositions, and the tradition of economics, in the case of economics, the tradition of economics that you've been formed in. And in, in most North American economics departments today, that's sort of a, a neoclassical synthesis that has a bit of Keynesianism thrown in there. Uh, but again, students aren't really, at least in the program that I was in, students aren't told that explicitly. Yeah. They're told, this is economics. Yeah. I mean, how can, how, how can you not, how can you talk about Keynes and, and Adam Smith and, and so on and not talk about philosophy? You have to. And worldview and so on. And I think, I don't know, because I don't think I've ever even taken an economics class and it probably shows in my bank balance, but it, it seems like there's a, um, a real dualism there that's probably um, uh, taking away from not only the discipline, but also from mm -hmm. economists being able to inject into other disciplines like yourself, guy who loved, thought he loved e economics wanted, and moves into history. Yeah, no, I think that's true. And you see it not only in economics, but uh, in different ways in other social science disciplines. Um, my colleague here, Dr. David Koizis, who teaches political science, uh, has often pointed out that political science has moved in a similar direction where mm. there's a de-emphasis on talking about political theory and the sort of normative questions of what should the state accomplish, what should politics accomplish, what should politics look like, and towards the empirical uh, and even quantitative questions of polling, collecting data, systems analysis, and so on. And again, all of that's important, but if political science is reduced simply to the empirical questions and leaves out the normative questions. I think something's lost. What? What? So what's? Why? Why is that? I mean, is are we? Are we? I mean, have, have we gone from a sort of uh, enlightenment modernistic understanding of the universe to a postmodern and back to enlightenment, or you know, this this idea that we want uh, his solutions? I mean, I work in international development. I see it with donors all the time. David, what about impact? What about results? Mm -hmm. You know, show me. Well, they don't say show me the log frame or show me the chart, but they want to know what the percentages are. They want to know what the numbers are. And I sometimes think that, um, yeah, there seems to be a bit of a dangerous trend happening everywhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're, we're getting away a little bit from, from my area of expertise, my area of expertise uh, partly because my own economics yeah, that's degree right. didn't You're a historian. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I, I think somebody like Jacques Ellul would say yeah. it's, it's part of the obsession of modern Western civilization with technique. Yeah, sure, sure. And we'd rather talk about um, how do you crunch the numbers than what numbers should you be crunching? So tell me um, uh, a little bit more about your uh, your book um, mm -hmm. uh, after evangelicalism. Love the title. Yeah, thank um, you. Uh, haven't read the book, so sorry about that. Uh, but but I have read a couple uh, reviews. I've read a couple mm -hmm. interviews with you online. They're they're out there, folks. A few articles. Yep. Um, 
yeah, tell me a little bit more about not only maybe the genesis of the project, but but what what you've started to see since. Yeah. Well, the the thing that drew me to the the topic <coughs> was uh, that in my hometown, which is uh, Kitchener, Kitchener, Ontario, uh, the local newspaper, the the Waterloo Region Record, would have a weekly column by a United Church minister named hmm. Frank Morgan, and. Uh, Morgan was was quite liberal in his theology, even by the standards of the United Church. And uh, that was not the environment that I was raised in. And, and I would read his columns every week and sort of scratch my head and not really know what to make of where he was coming from. And then later in life, when I did decide to do graduate research in the area of history, I was interested in Canadian religion. And the United Church has been for most of the 20th century, the largest Protestant denomination in Canada. Um, so trying to understand how did the United Church become what it is today was something that interested me a great deal. And that's ultimately where this book project came from. And I focused on the question of the shift from the evangelical roots of the United Church and its Methodist and Presbyterian forebearer denominations and the transition from those evangelical roots to the present day United Church, which is very different in right. terms of its spirituality and its sense of priorities. And would you say um, that what one of those major differences is its um, um, liberal take on theology versus a conservative approach? Is that, Absolutely. Is that the fundamental difference? That's, that's one of the fundamental differences, perhaps the most fundamental difference. Um, and you can see this in a variety of areas, but um, the much more critical attitude towards the Bible is uh, one area where you see it. Uh, but you also see it in general in terms of a more questioning or open-minded, uh, to put it in positive terms, more open-minded attitude towards traditional Christian teachings. So we've seen things like uh, prominent United Church ministers uh, say that they don't believe in God, which is an exception, but the fact that it's a position that's held by a minister of the church uh, without any sort of repercussions, disciplinary repercussions, um, I think illustrates that the United Church is a, is a kind of church where uh, it's quite possible to um, question, challenge, and even disbelieve in beliefs that many other Christians would regard as being essential or fundamental to Christianity. So do you have a problem, uh, would you say you have a problem with the questioning, would you say, or the, the uh, of, of traditional beliefs, uh, or I mean, you know, being a minister and saying you don't believe in God is pretty extreme. <laughs> that actually is kind of funny. There's got to be a, mm. a comedy skit there. But but uh, the whole notion of questioning, I mean, you're an academic. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is the world you live in, right? You oh, are absolutely. asking for yeah. questions. You're peeling back layers and you're, you know, I haven't sat in one of your classes, but I bet, mm -hmm. you know, you are you are open to questions. Oh, your absolutely. Students, right? Yes, you don't yes. shut things down. <laughs> so, so uh, is that the issue, though? Is it that people in the church are allowed to challenge these things, or is it that they're getting away with it? Well, I, tr I, I try to distinguish between a number of things. Uh, one is my take on this as a historian, which is simply n not to evaluate, mm -hmm. is this a good change, is this a bad change? Uh, and, and I very much try to avoid that in the book. But instead, simply to understand how did this change come about? It's a profound change. Uh, at one point in the book, I actually liken it to um, one institution used to be inhabited by one religion is, and is now inhabited by a different religion altogether. It's, it's a huge change. So in the book I'm asking just how did that happen? Why did it happen? What was the process? Uh, without saying, you know, this was good or bad at all. Right, right. One can also look at it sociologically and look at some of the consequences of the change. And, and one of the consequences that is of particular interest to people uh, is the numerical decline of the denomination. And um, I do think, and of course there's people who disagree with me, I do think there's a causal link between the, the liberal orientation of the United Church and the numerical decline that it suffered. Um, and then of course there's the question of my own personal theological take. And I am somebody coming from an evangelical point of view. So uh, my sympathies are more with the earlier period mm -hmm. of United Church history. But again, in, in the book and in my research, when I'm looking at things as a historian, um, I'm trying simply to understand rather than to pass judgment. Are you comfortable being known as an evangelical today? Yes. 
so when I, I mean, I, I certainly I grew up in the church and I have, a, have quite an eclectic background, I mm -hmm. suppose. Uh, the people I've met along the way, my, my you know, training in philosophy and so on, and my traveling now. Um, I wonder if the the I wonder if the word evangelical has been hijacked to some mm. degree. I wonder if it doesn't mean what it used to, and if that's true, does it bother you? Oh, it's a word that's changed meaning a lot of times. Um, you know, it originally meant essentially Protestant in the aftermath of the Protestant Reformation. In fact, that's still the meaning that it has in Germany. Um, but yeah, it's, it's shifted several times over the course of the 20th and into the 21st century, especially in North America. And uh, one of the things I think we're witnessing today is a, is a destabilization of the concept. Hmm. Um, so in the late 20th century, it had come to have a pretty settled, if not very sharply defined, meaning. And I think that's, that, that's breaking down. The evangelical consensus, if you will, of the late 20th century, I think, is breaking down today. Um, and I, w whether I'm comfortable with it or not, um, I certainly think it's important for people to know what they mean when they use words. Mm -hmm. So I define evangelicalism in my book to have a particular meaning, and that's how I use it in the book. Right. But of course, there's no one right way to use the word. Right. I, th I mean, uh, forgive me, but when I still, to this day, with my background and so on, and, and what mm -hmm. I'm into today, I, I hear evangelical, and I kind of, my, my needle eventually mm. uh, goes towards way right wing, fundamentalist, mm. extremist, um, not rational, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, unfortunately. And I mean, yeah. maybe that's more my fault than anything, or maybe we could say it's partially the media's fault, you know, the way evangelicals have been represented in film and, mm -hmm. and, 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 and in the media in general, in the news media uh, particularly. Um, but, but I think of the Jerry Falwells of the world and right. some of those right just radical statements that stand out, you know, 9-11 mm -hmm. mm -hmm. and Pat Robertson and some of the ridiculous things that we, we I don't know you well enough yet to know, but right. we probably agree on, <laughs> were ludicrous and boy, yeah. I wish they hadn't have said that and wow, oh, look at the damage they've done, kind of. Right. So so how do you how do you respond to that at a, mm -hmm. at a dinner party? When, even, really? You're an evangelical? Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, really? it, it, <laughs> it depends very much on who you're talking to, yes, I think. Of course. But, um, on the one hand, I think there is a perception problem, mm -hmm. and uh, another one of my, my good friends, Dr. David Haskell of Wilfrid Laurier University, has published a book called Through a Lens Darkly, mm -hmm. uh, which studied news media coverage of Canadian evangelicals in the Canadian national media. And he found what I would call evidence of, of pretty systematic misrepresentation of evangelicals in the news media, um, partly to confirm pre-existing stereotypes that journalists already had of, of what evangelicals were about. Now, some of those stereotypes have some basis in fact. Um, the fundamentalist movement of the early uh, 20th century did take an anti-intellectual turn over the, the middle part of the 20th century, particularly in the United States. And I think that reputation of evangelicals as being anti-intellectual, anti-rational. I think that has lingered in many circles. Um, and of course, evangelicals, again, particularly in the United States, have been associated with more conservative political T causes. Tea party kind of stuff, of yeah, late anyway. that's right. Yeah. Um, that's less true in Canada. Uh, you know, research on voting trends among Canadian evangelicals shows that it's a pretty mixed picture. Evangelicals in Canada vote for all of the major parties. Um, they lean slightly more conservative than the Canadian population, but they also lean slightly more NDP than the Canadian population. Um, so it, it's, it's hard to paint everyone in the movement sure. with one yeah. brush, especially yeah. when you get into political questions. The, uh, Mark Knoll said the scandal of the evangelical mind is that there's not much of an evangelical mm -hmm. mind in, in the scandal of the evangelical mind. Yeah. Um, historian, fellow historian, uh, yeah. I believe. Uh, do you, so you, you talked about that intellectual sort of shift. Right. Um, do you th still think that um, we're suffering from that today? And, and when I say that, I guess I mean, I guess there's the church, capital C, small c, et cetera, mm -hmm. but as communities of, of believers, you know, oh, gee, you're a creationist, so therefore yeah. you can't be an intellectual, you know, right. that, that kind of an approach. Do you think that's a problem? Do you think that, you know, you talked about problem of perception, which is great. I want to go back to this notion of the, it's awesome, the destabilization of the concept, right. you know, of evangelical. Yeah. I mean, I'd love to unpack that a little bit more with you. But, but yeah, do, do, do you think that anti-intellectual movement uh, 
uh, Oz Guinness has talked about it as mm -hmm, well, I believe, mm -hmm. another, another writer. Uh, you know, fit, what, what was the title of his book? Fit, fit Bodies, Fat Minds. Mm. You know, this idea that, that we aren't really um, um, speaking the truth. Yeah. No, I, I think there is some truth to it even today. I think things have improved a great deal since Noel originally wrote The Scandal of the Evangelical Mind. Um, one sign of that in Canada is the emergence of a number of Christian universities, including Redeemer, uh, where I work, uh, that are broadly evangelical in their orientation and um, which have been uh, doing a great deal to connect the world of evangelical faith and the world of academia. And I think that's a very positive development. Well, let's put a little McLean's plug in here. Well, not mm -hmm. a McLean's plug, but a Redeemer plug. Uh, did I recently see the Redeemer was like pretty top five in a couple of the McLean yes, surveys, top yeah. universities in Canada? We, we've That's done fantastic. very well uh, in the area of student satisfaction surveys. Um, we're often in the top five. Sometimes we're at we're the very top in certain categories in, in the country in terms of student satisfaction. It's partly because we're small. Small universities small, yeah. do well. Well, yeah, and you get, I mean, I, I remember my schooling, you know, we had classes of, of you know, 9, 10, 12, 15. Maybe that's a thing of the past, but but I bet with a smaller uh, university, you're, get, you're getting mm -hmm. a little more intimacy. You that's get a little right. more access. You right? do. And, and we also think that the, the Christian element plays a role uh, right. in the way that professors think of students. Uh, they're not only students. They're not only especially numbers. Yes. Um, but they're human beings and they're, they're fellow sure. uh, brothers and sisters sure. in Christ. Um, so what are the implications for the church as a whole? I mean, I, I, I guess I care about the United Church, but mm -hmm. um, what, about, what about the church as a whole? Is it crumbling? Uh, is it falling apart at the seams? Are people leaving in droves? I mean, these are the things you sort of hear, yeah. um, that, that uh, churches don't resonate with uh, young people. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, it's got to be more than uh, about hip music and so on. Well, this is going to be a very academic answer, but <laughs> that's okay. The, the answer we'll dig, is we'll dig a little bit. It depends. It depends yeah, on which yeah. church you're looking at. Right. Yeah, sure. Um, so what we've seen in Canada is that the, the traditionally dominant Christian groups, which includes uh, the Catholic Church and particularly the mainline, so-called mainline Protestant groups, the United Church, the Anglicans, to a lesser extent, the Presbyterians. Um, they've experienced significant declines since the 1960s in terms of um, the most sensitive measures of involvement. So not only membership measures, but also things like attendance at religious services. And um, the, the hardest hit groups in Canada have definitely been those mainline Protestant groups, including the United Church. And they've been declining since the 60s. The United Church, for example, has lost about 50% of its membership since the 1960s. And um, my phone's going off there. That's all right. It's kind it of might, interesting. Uh, might get picked up. <laughs> that's okay. Some, something, but that's what we, uh, just the sound? So they've lost 50% uh, of their membership since the 1960s, but a more worrying statistic is they lost 90% of their Sunday school enrollment. Hmm. And that's the future of the church, right? It's, it's where the children are, are formed into the faith. Um, so there's been a huge decline in those areas. And that's what gets a lot of attention and press in Canada because... They're the traditionally dominant groups. The picture with Catholicism is a little bit more complicated because they've also benefited from Catholic immigration over the last several decades. Um, and there you have to factor in that Quebec is really a whole different kettle of fish than the rest of the country mm -hmm. when it comes mm -hmm. to Catholicism. But what doesn't get noticed as much is that uh, over the same period of time, the evangelical Protestant groups, which were initially quite a bit smaller than the mainline Protestant groups, were growing through that whole same period since the 1960s. Mm. So uh, the Pentecostal Assemblies of Canada, for example, basically tripled in size over the second half of the 20th century. Mennonite Brethren doubled. Hmm. Uh, Fellowship of Evangelical Baptist Churches doubled. So they continued to grow. They were smaller to begin with um, and uh, more on the fringes, as it were. Now that growth seems to have plateaued since about the turn of the century, okay. since about the year 2000. Mm -hmm. And um, all of the religious groups in Canada today all of the major Christian groups, at least, that have been studied, um, seem to be having a hard time holding on to their young people. Evangelicals are doing a much better job of holding on to their young people, but they're still using, losing a good chunk of them mm -hmm. from childhood mm -hmm. to young adulthood, um, whereas uh, the losses among, again, mainline Protestants are basically catastrophic. It's hard to see how they're going to be able to pull out of that. 
And and would you does your book say and do you say that this is again back to this whole liberal conservative distinction from a theological perspective? I do think that's one of the major factors, perhaps the most important distinguishing factor for the period from 1960 to 2000 or so. Um, when you look at what really is the main difference between the churches that were growing and the churches that were shrinking, it does seem to be in the area of their their theology. Um, the more conservative churches were more likely to grow. Um, and uh, whether that was due directly to the theology or whether it was due to some of the practices um, and characteristics that flowed from the theology, that's a more difficult question to answer. I mean, I, honestly, you know, I made the joke about the minister not believing in God. I mean, that's mm -hmm. a pretty serious uh, statement to make from the pulpit. You can imagine yeah. people leaving that particular church, I suppose, in droves. That's right. Um, but when it gets to, you know, you get into a little more of the relational stuff, things that are a little more difficult to... Mm -hmm perhaps interpret or there's mm -hmm. you know the hotter issues divorce you know these yep. kinds of things homosexuality things that I mean I, I, I think that is going to be the issue for the church as mm -hmm. well, you know for the next hundred years maybe 50 maybe less who knows but yeah. um, was it was it about the biggies do you think or was it more about uh, some of the some of those uh, um, or was it just a kind of a cumulative effect over time I, I think the specific issues so for example the responding to the sexual revolution of the 1960s yep. and the sort of outworking of the sexual revolution. Um, those issues have, have been very important and have attracted a lot of attention, but the responses to the issues reflect underlying deeper religious differences hmm. between the hmm. evangelicals and the mainline. Um, and I think there's sort of two things that happened in the mainline. One is that there were defectors, people who left the mainline and went to the evangelical churches because they were more evangelical as their forebears had been and they were alienated by the new direction taken by the mainline churches after the 60s. Um, but I think a larger group of Canadians simply dropped out. They didn't defect mm. to the evangelicals. Right, right. They dropped out. Just and I think that's I'm where... I'm done? I'm done. Yeah. yeah, that's where that no religion category that we see growing census after census, I think that's primarily where they're coming from, from the mainline churches and particularly the mainline Protestant That's churches. That's pretty interesting. Yeah, I, I want to follow that for a second, but I do want to get, don't, let's not forget the question, what did the United Church get right? I want to ask right. that question, and what did evangelicals get wrong? It's, mm -hmm. it's a polarized question, I get that, but sure. still at the same time, kind of fun for an interview. Um, is it possible that people left, uh, were leaving some of these mainline de denominations because the church was, I don't know, becoming more inward, navel-gazing, uh, not not interested in developing deeper relationships, mm. um, losing their ability to be transparent and authentic. And uh, I mean, if I had one or two beefs about Christians yeah. or evangelicals or religious folk, let's just put religious right. folk as this inability to just be human. Mm, right. Just for crying out loud, just relate. Yeah. Just have a smoke with me. Yeah. You know, have a, have a glass of wine. Like, let's just sit down and chat about things that we may not agree on. Right. And be human beings about it. And I'd like to think most people can do that, but yeah. maybe, and maybe this is just my challenge to the human race. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> maybe I'm just annoyed with other human <laughs> beings right now. Yeah. Right? So, yeah. With other human beings. <laughs> <with that>, <laughs> That's right. <laughs> we do have somebody down the hall in 212 uh, right. who, who, who does offer some counseling sessions. Yeah. Uh, yeah. T t talk to me about the, mm -hmm. the church's inability to be authentic or transparent yeah. or honest. Is that, is that a factor? Well, I, I don't think it's a factor in the, the decline that I've studied. And, and the reason I say that is because one of the emphases that, that came into the United Church in the 60s was actually an emphasis on what at the time was called frankness. Hmm. Hmm. So they wouldn't have used the language of authenticity at that time, but they used the language of frankness. Uh, and one of the things that they were increasingly frank about were those uh, theological questions, but also... Uh, the more more liberal or radical theological leanings of many of the leaders, which they'd actually held pretty close to their chests in previous decades. Not in the 60s. In the 60s, everybody wanted to get everything out in the open and talk about it. Um, and I think that was probably a healthy development. I think that well, was a good su development. Well, you, you suggest that some of these changes and shifts were occurring 20, 30 years before. Behind before, the scenes. Yeah, behind, behind the, the scenes. scenes yeah. 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 Um, so I, I think that was a healthy development insofar as it went. Um, but what it did was polarize the church to some extent. It drove out some of the more evangelical-leaning folks. And um, although I think most people and most Canadians think dialogue is important and think authenticity and openness is important, um, 
the, the crucial area where the United Church and churches like it seem to be struggling is that they can offer dialogue and they can create space for dialogue, but it's not clear what voice they're bringing to the dialogue in hmm. some cases. Hmm. So, for example, we uh, had some people in a study that, that I did with my colleague David Haskell. We had some people look at some advertising material that the United Church put out a few years ago. And the purpose of the campaign was to brand the United Church or communicate the identity of the United Church as a very open-minded, question-friendly, seeker-friendly kind of a church, right? If you have questions, if you have doubts, you're welcome in the United Church. And the advertising was very, very effective at conveying that message. And what we found is that message resonated with the people that sure. we showed the advertising to. I would to. think so, yeah. But they were left thinking, so what does this church stand for then? And the ones who liked the message of the United Church as being open-minded, questioning, in tune, relevant, and so on, is that they thought, well, that's very nice, and we, we approve of that, but we're not interested in going to church. The people who were interested in maybe going to church were looking for a church that could offer them not only questions, but answers. Right. So, I mean, if there's sort of a practical takeaway from this for churches. I think it's that Canadians appreciate openness to dialogue, they appreciate openness to questions, but then they also expect you to bring some answers to the table, to bring some answers to the dialogue. Here's what we believe, here's what we stand for. And what do you think, you know, as a philosopher, what do you, what do you think if there's not a, not really a clear-cut answer about mm -hmm. a particular issue, <laughs> then what? You well, know, I mean, <clears> I'm, I, I, uh, I guess, you know, probably if you were interviewing me, I'd probably tell you I was more interested in the question. Yeah. the answer and that you don't have to agree with that but what, right. what do you think about that from a, a Christian perspective or a, a yeah I mean I, I think as Christians we we don't want to uncritically accept the kind of modernist or enlightenment view of truth that we have to have certainty on every point um, I don't think that's essential to Christianity um, but I think what we do have as Christians and what we need to have as Christians is uh, increasing levels of confidence in certain beliefs as you move closer and closer to the core of the Christian faith. So there are certain things I think that we need to hold to very, very tightly and very strongly um, as being essential to the Christian faith. And then as you move sort of out towards more peripheral issues, you can hold those issues more loosely. And I think we always need to be opening, open to questioning and opening, open to dialogue. Uh, but I think it's possible to be open to questions and open to dialogue and still have a point of view that you believe is true. Are we certain about anything in this life? I would say, no, we're not certain about anything. Um, but ultimately, we have to sort of decide, okay, well, what do I believe about this or that fundamental question? And how am I going to live my life? New, Newbegin called it a proper confidence. Proper confidence, which is yeah, a I like wonderful that phrase for, for so many reasons, from an epistemological perspective, I think, from a historical perspective, and raising kids. Mm -hmm. Raising kids. I have a six and eight year old. You know, they come up on almost every podcast I do. And, and I think, really, I mean, I don't, you know, your kids think you know everything. Sort of. Right. And then eventually, you know, they realize... Eventually they think you know nothing. That's right. And, I mean, de Beauvoir nailed it in The Ethics of Ambiguity. Just nailed it. Man's unhappiness is first due to his having been a child, period. Hmm. Man's unhappy. Right. <laughs> and, and, and it has to do with this, you know, this umbrella, she called, of, of protection that we were under. And then at some point in our lives we realize our parents... Our, the institutions, the Sunday schools and the churches and the, and the schools and so on, they didn't know either. And now what? Now right. what do I do with this, right? right? It's, it's a wonderful analysis of, I think, yeah. the human condition. Um, so what did the, the United Church uh, 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 get right? What, what did they do right? I mean, did they, did mm. they, uh, did they ignite uh, a conversation? You know, you talk about mm. dialogue, having a point of view, and so on. Did they, um, you know, uh, create a, a movement that has mm -hmm. moved towards a more authentic self, a more frank self? You know, uh, yeah, I mean, it w I, I, do, I do think the movement towards authenticity was a good one in the 60s. I think um, it cleared the air on mm. a, lot of, a lot of things that hadn't been very clear before the 1960s. Um, so I think that was in and of itself a good thing. Um, another thing that I, that I admire about the United Church, about the tradition of the United Church, is uh, they've always believed that Christianity speaks to social and political issues. Mm. It's not a, 
it's not a private uh, experience of the worshiper, but it's something that has something to say about social pro uh, problems. It has something to say about suffering in the world. It has something to say about uh, good government. And uh, I, th I think that's absolutely right. Is that, is that where evangelicals have dropped the ball, do you think? You know, to go to the other side, the, what did evangelicals get wrong? Uh, I think the evangelical tradition, as you trace it back to the Reformation, um, has always also been characterized by political and social engagement. I think more recently in the 20th century, again in connection with the fundamentalist movement, there was a, a reaction against the social gospel movement of early theological liberalism, uh, which said that all that Christianity is, is basically a set of prescriptions for how to fix society's problems. And fundamentalists uh, reacted against that and, and went to the other extreme of saying, well, we need to retreat from the world, we need to retreat from engagement with social and political issues because that smacks of the social gospel. But I think evangelicalism in North America has really uh, moved past that since the 1960s. Um, and certainly we see that evangelicals today are engaged not only in terms of political engagement in a variety of forms, but also in you know feet on the ground, getting their hands dirty uh, with a variety of causes. I'm you mentioned World Vision. I think yeah, that's a good yeah. example. I'm reading Rodney Stark's The Rise of Christianity right now, and, mm -hmm. and I've never read it cover to cover, and uh, it's a dry read, Rodney, but um, it's excellent. It's so yeah. good to just, you know, the, the notion that... Uh, it, um, it was better to be a 12-year-old Christian girl uh, yeah. in around 100 or 200 BCE than it was to be a 12-year-old pagan girl. Mm. And, the, and, the, and the conclusions that he draws from that, it's really quite yeah. fascinating. You know, the university, uh, what, what was going on in, in hospitals and so on, uh, you know, with Christians, infanticide, abortion, these kinds of things mm -hmm. that made a yeah. difference in how societies either grew or declined. Yeah. And um, anyway, fas fascinating read from a, from a historical perspective. Oh, oh it is. Yeah. And I think, it's, I think it's part of the core of Christianity. Um, and, and it's something that the tradition that Redeemer is part of has always emphasized as well. Um, and that is that following Jesus is not something that only has private implications. It has public implications. Right, it has right. implications for how you treat your neighbor, how you treat your fellow citizen, how you treat the weakest people in your society. What do you do? Uh, we got to come to the end of this in a couple of minutes. And we've, mm -hmm. we've, I wanted to ask you a little bit about some of your students and some of the, you know, you've been teaching for a while now and just to see if we could get to, to some of those issues as well. Because I would imagine your students care about the social gospel uh, or at least being politically and socially engaged. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but uh, I'm wondering, um, um, well, why, why, don't, why don't you just uh, touch on that briefly before, yeah. before we kind of wrap up, and I'll, I'll wrap up with my other, my other question. Well, I see two things among our students uh, in this regard. One is uh, they very strongly want to have some kind of a positive impact in the world. Sure. So yes, they're concerned about getting a job, um, and rightly so, uh, particularly in our current economic climate. But they, they don't want just any job. A lot of them want to make a difference in some way. They may have unrealistic expectations about what that's going to look like, and, and there's a learning process there. Yes. But they're passionate. I mean, they want their lives to count. Uh, and, and for our students, that's rooted in, in a Christian conviction and a Christian sense of calling. The other thing I see is a real hunger to understand hmm. the world, and particularly to that's understand good. how the world got to be the way it is hmm. uh, with all of its warts. And um, this is, of course, where my own discipline history uh, can really play a role in helping us to understand how did Canadian society get to be the way that it is? How did the world stage get to be the way that it is today? And we can't answer all the questions, obviously, and I already have said we shouldn't pretend to have absolute certainty about everything. Um, but I think we can work towards answers, and I think when students leave here, they still have that passion um, but it's a passion that's better informed, that's uh, more realistic about the world and about what they can do in it, and uh, that's ultimately rooted in some kind of a tradition that's larger than just the needs of the moment. So you take your role as a professor pretty seriously? I do. As, as a teacher, not as a professor. I'm talking not the researcher, not the marker, et mm -hmm. cetera, not the administrator, but the in-classroom guy on the, on the stage, the theatrical it, yes. guy. <laughs> Yeah, that's my number one job. Yeah, that's my number yeah. one job. Yeah, yeah. and and uh, do, you, do you do you do you provoke? 
Uh, from time to time, yeah, I do. From time yes, to time, from yeah. time to time. Um, <laughs> Very good. I, See, I, I, uh, I, I love that about teaching. And, and uh, before the recorder was on, you and I talked about a former professor of mine. Who, yes. I never knew where he stood. Yeah. And it, it just, I have so, so many fond memories of, of standing out in the hallways. Did you hear what he said? Yeah. Really? Did he actually say that? You know, and it would be to stimulate. And I got to know him later, and 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 I still don't know where he stands. But but it got us thinking about yeah. things in a way that we would never have considered if he hadn't presented it in this way. I think one of the essential roles of a university professor and of the university generally is to allow people to see different points of view and appreciate the points of view that they disagree with. Um, you know, I am, for example, not a committed Marxist. I'm not, I'm not really, really a Marxist of any stripe. <laughs> but when I talk about Karl Marx with my students, I want them to be able to understand the appeal of his thought. I want them to be able to see why Marxists historically and today uh, have been drawn to him. I want them to get why people would be interested in this. If they don't get that, they're not really going to be able to have an effective conversation with people who adhere to that philosophy. And that's, that's just one example. Um, and so I think it's important to me that even where I agree with what most of my students think, I want them to be in, I want them to encounter challenges to that way of thinking in a, in a sympathetic way so that they can look at them and say, I understand where people who think differently are coming from. And I think that enables them to be better conversation partners. And in fact, to be more persuasive advocates for their point of view. Kevin, thanks for joining us uh, today. It's been a great conversation, and, and uh, I, I, my, my, uh, my thought is that we've, again, barely scratched the surface on this topic. I say it every, every uh, podcast, and I'm sure people are tired of it, but clearly there's, uh, there's more going on here than meets the eye. Um, so thank you for joining us today. It's been a lot of fun. Thanks for having me.